So hello and welcome to Module 2. Tonight we're going to be talking about all things strings with a little bit of list thrown in for um, interest. So I'm going to start with a presentation. Um, can somebody mute because I'm... Okay. Let me check. Does anybody hear echoing? Because I heard it, but I don't now. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so we're going to do what we did last week. I'm going to talk, and we're going to show a little presentation, and then I'm going to go to the code, and we're going to go back and forth. I'll answer any questions that anyone has. We are going to go through uh, the labs at the end, or at least the flow for the labs. So tonight we're talking about strings, and we talk about lists so we can understand strings better. Strings are the basis of a lot of what you're going to be doing in Python, so it's an important concept to get clear in your mind, especially before we go into next week. Um, this week is more basics. Last week was the basics, input, process, output. We're building on those. We're talking about strings and how to do string manipulation. Um, and then next week we're going to shift gears and we're going to start to talk about logic. So we want to have the basics from week one and week two down pretty well before we go into week three. And um, just to let you know, Next week, this lecture is going to be on a Wednesday night. I will be traveling on Thursday, so I will be unable to do it on Thursday night. So I'm going to put that. Um, I'll send the announcement out to the instructors. I'll put the announcement out for my class. But next week at 9 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday, we will have the Module 3 lecture. So. Um, what is a string? Very simply, it's just an ordered collection of characters surrounded by quotes. It's all a string is. You can pretty much have anything you want in a string. Um, and, and it's very simple, but it's also very powerful. Um, one of the things you have to remember about a string is that it is immutable. And what immutable means is you can't change it. You just can't. Once you create a string, the string is like that forever. Now, you can create a new string from an old string and modify it during the creation. Um, you can split a string apart into a list and change the list and combine it back together. So there are techniques to modify the values in a string, but they won't be that identical string. There'll be a copy of it with modifications made during the copy, or there'll be, uh, there's other ways to kind of manipulate the, the information and get it back into a string format. But that's very important. A lot of people try and, and change a string, and you cannot do that. So let's just get a little bit of visual going. All right, when you have a Python script, you're going to see a variable name, and you're going to see a value with the assignment character, same as last week. So in this case, my stir is the name of my variable. I have an assignment operator in the middle. And then after that, I have my string surrounded by quotes. Now, what you'll notice at the bottom of the screen, the screen is, it says this, there's all these little boxes. And that's because that's how Python sees a string. You'll notice there are no quotes. The quotes are not part of a string. There's simply a syntax to tell Python that what's inside of them is a string. So. This is just how Python sees it. It is a series of characters in order. OK, so here's a rule. For every open quote, you must have a closing quote of the same type. 
That's very important. A lot of people get messed up with strings because they don't realize that you have to open and close with the same quote and you have to have opening and closing quotes. So let's talk about what a string is not. A string is not that. Remember, there's no closing quote here. If it is not a closing quote, Python's going to give you a syntax error. Okay. This is also not a string to Python because it opens with a double quote and it closes with a single quote. Again, this is a syntax error. Python will simply give you a nasty error message, and we'll look in a few minutes of what those nasty error messages might look like, and your program will stop. So, this is another error, because when you look at this originally, you're saying, but I opened with a, a double quote and I closed with a double quote. Well, the problem is there's also a double quote inside the string. So Python doesn't know where to end here. It doesn't know where to end at the quote before the capital S in string or um, at the very at the qu double quote right after the G. And so it's going to choose the double quote, the first double quote it comes to, which means everything after string is going to be a syntax error. So these are not strings because they are not complete or they're wrong in some way. And you, Python and all programming languages require that you be very precise with the syntax. So that's kind of why I've got, you know, the big red letters here because you have to remember, and unfortunately, a lot of students, when they start getting into, especially next week when we start doing the longer labs, some of these small things get missed, and it becomes a frustration cycle. They can't figure out why their program isn't working, and sometimes it's just because they have missed one small thing in the syntax. So... Our first rule is still, for every open quote, you must have a closing quote of the same type. So let's correct some errors. So this is the first one, and the closing quote is missing. Well, how do we correct that? Well, we add a closing quote. That's all you have to do. The next one, this has an open double quote, and it had a closing single quote. Well, how do I correct this? Very easily, you just replace the closing single quote with a double quote, and your string is now complete. And this one is a little bit different. You have an opening double quote, and you have the closing double quote. But what do we do with that double quote in the middle? Well, what we do is we escape it. And the escape, oh, that wasn't lined up, sorry basically tells Python, hey Python, don't look at this as a double quote that ends the string. It's supposed to be included in the string. And what you do is you put a slash before the double quote. So those are how we correct some of the syntax errors. So there's our rule again. If a closing, and the, the second rule is, if a closing quote of the same type is included, is inside a string, you have to escape it. Okay, what does ordered mean? So we now know what, it, what the syntax is to make up a string. So, but we have this other thing of an ordered collection of characters. And this becomes important when we want to create new strings based on the string that we currently have. And you're going to have to use this concept in labs. So what you see, this is a string, what Python sees. Well, we've seen this before. That is all the little boxes that make up all the little characters. But how does Python keep track of order? Well, Python keeps track of order by giving every element in the list a number. And we can call that number the index. Now, there's a couple things to notice as the screen scrolls by. 
um, you'll notice that the first number is not 1, it's 0. Um, every, every term I get the question, why is it 0? I have no good answer for why it's 0. It simply is 0. And it's like that in a lot of programming languages, too. The first character, the first element of a list always starts at 0. And this is another place where some students will get tripped up because it's the first place, so they want it to be 1 because that makes sense. Unfortunately, that's not the way it works in Python. The first place, the first index number is always zero. So every character in a string has a numerical placeholder and that placeholder is called an index. Okay, so now we're about to take a foray into lists. So why are we going to take a foray into lists? Well, because string, a string is a list and it's just a special kind of list. So to understand exactly how a string works, we need to understand how lists work. Now, list is just an ordered collection of elements. A string is an ordered collection of characters. A list expands on that. You can have a string in a list, or a float in a list, or a number in a list. You can have all kinds of different things in a list. Um, and they are changeable. So you can change a list. So what do you see in your script? This is what you see in your script. So I have a variable called my list. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. Now I have some new syntax here. I have these square brackets and these commas. So the square brackets always opens um, a, I got ahead of myself, sorry. The square bracket always opens a list and the, sorry, the left square bracket opens a list and the right square bracket closes a list. So what does Python see? This is what Python sees. It sees three things in my list and each of those things are given a number starting at zero. And now we have our new syntax. A list always starts with an open square bracket. You have an element. All elements are separated by commas. There's another element. And notice the first element is different type than the second element. The first element's a string. The second element's an integer. Again, separated by a comma. The third element is a float. And then we have a close square bracket. So the, you have to think of these as balanced. For every open square bracket, I have to have a closed square bracket. For every um, element that is followed by another element, you have to have a comma. And those things are just the way Python syntax is. So it starts with a square bracket, and it ends with a square bracket. And the rule is list, a list contains element, and element can be any type and that all list elements have a corresponding index, and list elements are separated by commas. So those are just some rules to remember when you're doing your list. Okay, so let's go back, because I'm not ready to do CRUD yet. Yes. Um, the, the slides are not available for these presentations, Danielle. They will be up on my YouTube channel. Um, the quotes aren't needed for a list. The quotes are not what stop and start a list, Sandra. The quote, the quotes um, can be are used for strings, but the brackets are used for lists. That's right. The quotes are only needed for strings. If I have a string, I have to have quotes around it. So Lisa is a string. So it has to start and end with a with a quote, with with quotes. Um, but the other elements are an integer and a float. So let's go and take a look 
at, what was that? It was simple list. At simple list. Yes, I will make this bigger. Let's see. Move this over some. And we will get this configuration set up. Uh, simple list. Okay. Okay. Don't know why it gave me an error. Anyway. So what we have here, whoops, I don't know why that's price's length, but anyway, what we have here is in line number one, we have a list called my list. And the list contains, in this case, three elements. Those three elements are the word Lisa, the number 42, and the number 3.14. So I'm going to add a print statement here so we can see it. So we have a, things we can do with the list. So um, I don't know why it's prices length. Must have been copied from another uh, script that I had. So we can get the length of a list. Now this becomes important because it's important to know how long the list is. Right now I can see that that list is three elements. Sometime down in the future. Um, for example, today, it was in Java, but I was writing test cases. And sometimes the code that I write is about a third of the total code. And then two-thirds of the code will be test code to make sure that the code I wrote is as correct as I can make it. So I was doing some validation on email address, on what is allowed and not allowed for an email address. Um, and I had probably 50 test invalid email addresses, but I didn't know how many there were. But I can get the length of that list. So it'll tell me how many elements are in the list. Because I don't want to sit there and count every single invalid email address. I just want my computer programming language to tell me. So Python tells us how long a list is by using the len command, len, it's, sorry, the len function, len, it's a function, so you have open and close parentheses, and in the middle, the argument is the list or the string that you want to get the length of. Um, yeah, this is copied from another, let me finish this. Okay. So we'll go down through 8, 9, and 10 and probably add some stuff in a bit. But let's just um, debug my list. So if I go to my debugger, because I like my debugger, and I go to variables, I have created a variable. First of all, in PyCharm, the red dot means that I have a breakpoint, and I simply click the line to set or unset the breakpoint. If I am debugging, which is what the little bug is, it will stop every time I have a red dot. I know what line I'm on because the line is colored in blue. Um, and, and if you have any questions about PyCharm, let me know because your assignment this week is to install PyCharm and write your kind of first Hello World script. So what I have here on the console, and I apologize. Oh, I can make that a little bigger. Um, yes. So it will only run that part of the program. It'll only, it'll only run up to that red dot, and then it will stop and let you tell it when to run again. So the program hasn't actually stopped running. The execution is still going. Python has halted, that's a better word for it, has halted in place in the interpreter to allow me to evaluate. Maybe I want to see what my list is. Um, maybe I want to look at something else. But 
Python is is pausing on line four right now. So I can do things. And and this is helpful. I use the debugger all the time in my real world life. I find it makes it much, much easier for me to understand complex code and if something's not working right, to actually sit there and see what the logic I've written is doing. So back to PyCharm. Oops, another question. Did you create the breakpoint or did the debugger create it? I create the breakpoint. So let me stop the execution. And there are a couple of different ways to run. I guess this is a good aside. We'll talk a little bit about PyCharm for a second. Um, there are two ways to run a script in PyCharm. There's the green arrow, which just says run. And then there's the green bug, which is debug. Now you can run simply by hitting the run button. So I have an index out of range, and that's fine. Um, that's actually there to make a point. Sorry about that. And then you can debug. Well, if I debug it, the exact same thing is going to happen, and I have an error, which is fine. Um, so, so when I want to stop, let's say I want to, I want, a, I want Python to pause. When I, when I hit the green bug. So I'm going to just place my mouse next to the line number in this column here. And I'm going to just select with my mouse. And that red dot shows up. And that red dot means if I hit the green bug, not the green arrow, that it's going to stop right there. So that's how I created that debug. Breakpoint. That's what it's called. It's called the breakpoint. So, okay, no problem. Back we go. So I'm going to have, I can get the length of a list by simply using the len function and passing in my list. And I can step over that and move the blue line. So this will execute line number four, because line number four hasn't been executed yet. And it will go to the next executable line. In this case, it's line number six. So, and it will print the length of my list is three. Good idea to put a breakpoint when doing a big project or debugging by section. Yes. I use breakpoints all the time. I, I find it to be very good, especially when I have complex code. Uh, when I've written a complex algorithm, I'm a human being, I make mistakes. Nothing I've ever done in, my, in the world is completely perfect. I do the best job I can, but it's important to test your code, and when the tests fail, it's important to understand why. Now, there are some people that I work with who can just sit there and look at a beautiful page full of code and know exactly, ah, that's the error. For me, I like to use a debugger and step through the code so I can actually evaluate if I've made any other mistakes or if I haven't been optimum even in creating my algorithm. So I'm now on line eight. And I'm just going to step over these. And you'll see that it's printing. And we'll talk about create, read, update, and delete in a second. But it basically is just printing more lines. And then this is the, the error that you saw. This is the intentional error. Okay, I have basically stepped off the end of a list. And we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And we'll actually really talk about that. I think it's in module four where we really, or five, where we really dive into lists and dictionaries. But this is an intentional error to show you what will happen if you try and walk off the end of the list, if you go one too many in terms of your index. So let's go back 
and let's talk about CRUD. CRUD is create, read, update, and delete. Those are the four things you can do to a list. You can make a new list. You can access, read, sorry, create, make a new list, read, access data within a list, update, modify elements within the list, and delete, remove elements from the list, or remove the entire list. So that's what you can do. You can create, read, update, and delete four things. It seems really complex when you're looking at the code or when you're first introduced to the code, but if you remember, there's only four things you can do. Could somebody please mute? Thank you. It, it becomes easier. And by the way, you won't find the word CRUD in books. This is an old terminology from database days, but it makes perfect sense when you're dealing with lists and dictionaries. So create. So I have my empty, I'm creating an empty list. So an empty list is just a variable. In this case, my empty list. We know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side, it's just an open and closed square bracket. That open and closed square bracket indicates to Python that there's nothing in the list. Now, I can create a list that's populated. We already saw how this happened in the other code. I can access, read or access elements within the list by using that index. So in this case, how do I do that? What's the syntax for doing that? Well, the syntax for doing that is the name of the list, an open square bracket, the index number, and a closed square bracket. And in this example, you'll see that I'm asking for the value at index 0. And when I do that, Python goes out and it says, show me and get me index 0, and the value is, in this case, Lisa. So that is what's happening. So there's the syntax, and then there's what the syntax causes Python to do. And the syntax causes Python to retrieve that piece of data, which corresponds to the index value. So here's just another example. My list of two is going to get me 3.14. So that is create and read. Now we have update. Update means that I can modify things. So I've got my list here again, you know, Lisa. 42, 3.14, and I'm going to say my list of 1 is now going to equal 25, so I'm doing an assignment. And what this assignment does is it takes, it removes 42, and it puts in its place 25. And I can also append to the list. I can add things. There's actually a lot of different functions that you can use for a list, and append is just one of them. Append will add an element to the end of the list. And in this case, I'm adding an element whose name is a string add, and what Python will do is it will automatically assign that new element in the list a number. So this actually grows the list by one. Now, delete. Delete is a modification as well. And right now I have four elements in my list. But let's say I don't want Lisa in there anymore. So what's going to happen if I use DEL, which is a keyword, my list of zero, it's going to remove the first element from that list, Lisa. And then it's going to reorder. It's going to, re, excuse me, it's going to renumber all of the other elements in the list. So 25, the second element is now going to become the first element. So those index numbers change. And then also what I can do is I can remove an element from a list. And I can remove it based on its value. So I'm saying, hey, I no longer want, um, I no longer want the add value in the list, so just Take it away. Erase it. So we have create, read, update, and delete. Those are the four things you can do to a list, and these are how you do them.
So let's go back, look at the code again real quick. Yes. What is the practical reason for an empty list? Can we use, sorry, can we use a breakpoint middle of the script like is there any start and end breakpoint? There's no start and end breakpoint necessarily. You can use it at any point. You can put that red dot at any point in your script. Okay. Why would we have an empty list? Well, sometimes you don't know what you want in that list. Sometimes maybe that list is going to be populated by a query to a database. Or maybe somebody's going to enter um, maybe somebody's going to enter a lot of stuff. Um, pop is not the same as delete. Pop will remove the last element from the list. Um, let's see. So that's the reason for an empty list because in a data-driven application, you don't know what you're going to want in that list necessarily, so you may have to populate it at runtime, not while you're sitting there typing and creating the program. Um, so, yes. There's lots of examples where we can use a list. Um, you're going to be when your game is going to use a list and a dictionary. Okay? You can have a list of anything, and you may want to iterate over that list. When we get into looping, it's going to be a lot about lists and doing the same function on every single um, element in a list. For example, today I was writing some stuff to check the validity of email addresses in a specific, um, for a specific reason. And I, in my test code, I don't want to have a single line of code, you know, checking every single one of these different lit, everything, every single one of these different email addresses. So what I did was I put in, I put them in a list and then I wrote code that would actually go through that list element by element and element and check whether it was valid or not. And a lot of things that we see, an Excel spreadsheet is, and we'll look at this, an Excel spreadsheet is actually a uh, multi-dimensional list. So it's a list with other lists inside of it. So those are some examples. Um, can you do an input like user entry information into a list? Yes, um, we can. And we'll see some of that. And actually, I can give you some examples. Um, there's no real difference between the need to use POP and DEL. Either of them are fine. If they're valid for Python, they're fine. There's no necessarily reason to use one or the other. Um, but that's okay. You, it's, it's okay to, um, to be confused because there are lots of different ways to do things. Now, you have to remember, pop should not take an argument. Pop is simply, there's nothing in between it. So it's always that first element in the list. Dell will delete an element at an index. So they're not exactly the same. So um, let's go back. I'm wondering. Uh, no, we'll, we'll come back. And if there's another question, then I'll do it. So why in the world did we just talk about lists? Wait a minute. Let's go back to the code. Okay. So let's talk about what we did. This is accessing a list. Don't I have another one? I don't think so. Okay. So this is accessing a list. That's just what these three are. Okay. Now, one of the things you'll notice is that the length is three. So if I look at the console output, Back up here, okay, the length of my list is three. A common mistake that a lot of people make is they say, oh, get me the last element in the list, 
and I'll do it by getting the length. And they will simply say, um, my list of length, my list. So it would be because Len my list returns a number. That number is the length of the list. This is a statement that will always get you an error because remember list indexes start at zero. So you have zero, one, and two, and if you put the number three in there, you're going to do what we call walk off the end of the list, and it's going to have an index out of bounds issue. So if I run it, stop and rerun you'll see that right here I have um, an, in, an index error, list index out of range. So it's telling me that this is wrong because it is. Put this down here under that guy. Okay, so now let's go back and talk about why we talked about lists. Well, we talked about lists because a string is a list, but it can't be modified. I said that earlier, I'll say it again. It can't change a string. So what do I do if I want to change it? Well, I can copy and modify on the creation of a string. We just talked about CRUD. Does CRUD apply? Mm, kinda. You can create and read a list, you can delete an entire string, and you can update by creating a new string with a modification to the original string. So you're not actually updating the original string, but what you're doing is you're picking and parts out of it. So CRUD for a string. Create, just like we saw before. You can create an empty string. You can create a string that's populated. You can read, just like you read before, all right? Print Meister of zero gets me the T. Print Meister of 10 gets me S. Now, I can create and modify with slicing, all right? Slicing is a specific technique where you can tell Python to grab some characters and create a new string from those characters. So that's what this does, and that's what the syntax does. So in this example, I have my newster. My newster is an, a variable. I know it's a variable because it's on the left-hand side of a single equal sign. On the right-hand side of the single equal sign is the variable that represents my existing string. I have an open square bracket, and then I have two numbers separated by a colon. Well, what does that do? What those two numbers do is show me the starting and the ending minus one place. So in this case, I'm going to start at 10. I'm going to end at 12. So the, the top number, sorry, the, the starting number is inclusive. The ending number is not inclusive. And then I'm going to end it with a square bracket. So that's what string slicing does. You're going to have to use string slicing this week for the labs. So you can create a new string from an existing string using slicing. When slicing, the slicing start index is inclusive, the um, end index is not inclusive, and it's always start index, colon, end index. Okay, a little more string slicing. So there's some more things you can do. There's some shorthand. So no index at the end says get me everything from index number 8 to the end of the string. My new stir, uh, sorry, the colon Four says, um, get me everything from the start of the string through the fourth character. So, or through index three. So that's some more shorthand for slicing. So let's take a look at that in code. Okay, 
So let's make this bigger. So this is just a bunch of strings. This is a string I have. So this kind of describes what we were just doing. In fact, it is just what we were doing. Um, so I can debug this like I was before. Console, I've got my list. Whoops, I'm on the wrong one. My apologies. Let's go back. Uh, the configuration. Simple string. Okay. Uh, there's simple string. All right. Let's just debug. I'm at the console. Now, this is some place where I started and nothing has printed to the console, by the way. And you can do that. All you have to do is have an ex executable line of code. Okay? So I'm going to print my stir. Then I'm going to slice it. And we'll see down here I've got stir. I've got a string. I've got that. I'm printing out a, the index. I'm replacing. We're going to talk about that in a second. Um, I can find an index. I can replace things. I can count. You're going to need to know count as well. And I get the length. I'm trying to keep this so it's not as long as last week's. Okay, so we just went through this one. Okay. Okay, so some string methods, we just saw them. There's a lot of things you can do with a string. And Python gives you a lot of methods. Um, you can find a character. You can find the first instance of a character in the string. You can actually find the last instance if you want. But this example just shows you the first instance. You can replace an element in a string, but you'll also see that even though it says replace, you're creating a new string. You can also count the occurrences of a character in a string. In this case, I'm counting i. This will be important for one of the labs. So when it says it wants you to find the number of characters, or sorry, find the number of occurrences of a character, you're going to use count. Splitting and joining. This is also going to become important because you're going to use it in the labs. So you can create a list from a string, and you can create a string from a list. Splitting is the process of creating a list from a string. So I have a string with some delimiter, and, and the delimiter is just something that tells Python, hey, stop here and everything to the left is one element and then everything to the right is another element until I come up to that character again. It's a delimiter is just a character that tells Python to stop and make that an element. So the way I do this is I have my list variable it's on the left hand side of single equal sign. I have the existing string and I'm going to use the split method. And the split, sorry, the split function. And the split function does just that. It splits it apart. And you can have a space there. You can have a comma there. You will use a space in one of the labs tonight. And what it will do is it will create a list. And then you can join. So you're going to create a string from a list. And um, you've got two elements. And you're going to join it. Now, the syntax here is different. You can't just call join on, sorry, this is my bad. Let me, let me fix this. Join my list. Sorry about that. OK. So the syntax here is different. The syntax is. 
I have variable my sturt, so on the left hand side of a single equal sign. And then I have to have a character or another string. And in this case, I just have the empty string. But you have to call join on a string. And what that string is, is it's the separator. So just like I had a comma in the first string, in this case, I could have put a comma. I just chose to put an empty string. Dot join, join is the function name, and then the name of the list. And then it will actually put together a new string based on that. Now, this is really nice. If you've got a bunch of numbers, and those numbers have to be put together in a certain way, and, and they just have to have, let's say, a comma in between them because you're creating a comma separated value file, all you have to do is put a comma there and join them. And you will have created the comma separated values. And then that's formatting. So let's go back. Yes. OK. Um, can you slice a string between a white space from user input, so it would be an undefined white space placement until the user enters two passwords. You, so I think you're asking about one of the labs, and I'll show you an example. Um, if a string is immutable, how are we able to replace? The replace isn't actually changing anything in the string. It's creating a new string on the replace. So under the hood, Python is making a copy, and it's taking those characters out and replacing them with characters and giving you a whole new string. They are not the same string because they do not occupy the same memory space. So, um, so what we can do is I will show you an example um, in just a few minutes of how the input will need to work for your passwords. OK, so where was I? OK, a little bit of Python code. Um, simple split. So here's the Python code with a little bit extra. OK. Go to simple split. Oh, where is it? Simple split. OK. So here what we have is we have basically what we saw. And then I also did a few extra things down here to, um, to just show you what you can do when you're joining strings. So basically what we have is we have our string first and second. I'm going to split that string based on the comma. And then I'm going to get two elements for my list. I can then join those into a new string. I can also join them with a comma. So let's run this really quick and see what happens. So I went from the list, I, I went from my string first, second, actually, let me just debug it, it'll be easier. OK, so let's go to the console, make it a little bigger. So I'm going to step over. So I'm going to split my list, and now I'm going to print my list. So I've created a list from this string. The nice thing about PyCharm is on the line that the variable is, you can see what the value is. So I'm now going to create a new string, and I'm going to join my list with just spaces. Sorry, with just nothing. And now I'm going to join it with a comma. So I can do different things. I have a social security number. I'm going to split my social security number into its parts. I have a separator. I'm going to join the parts for the separator. And you'll see that it created the social security string. I have not put a print statement in. And then there's a, you know, a little bit of printing for the formatting. You have three parts. It gives you each of the different parts. Um, you have a separator, and you can join the parts. So that is splitting and joining. And let's go 
here. Okay, string formatting. Formatting is very important. You're going to do a lot of it in this class. And you're going to need it when it comes to the game. Um, there's a format function that works against any string. And it helps with code readability and it allows for parameterized string formatting. And I'll explain what that is in just a minute. Here's an example. Um, you have a placeholder. So a placeholder is an open squiggly brace and a closed squiggly brace. And potentially with something in between. There are three placeholders in this example. And by the way, it doesn't have to be a print function. This is just inside a print function call. So I have a placeholder that's empty, just and that's completely fine. That usually indicates that you're going to be putting a string, potentially an integer, into it. The one in the middle is the interesting one. And it's interesting because I'm going to use it to format a float. OK? And the syntax basically is colon.2f. And colon.2f just means I'm giving it a float. That's what the f means. And I want two decimals. I want two numbers after the decimal place. That's how that reads. F is the float. Dot two is how many decimal places after, sorry, how many numbers after the decimal. So let's go in and look at it a little bit closer. So I've got my example here, num1 pi meister. So it's a direct replacement. It is, and it's positional. So if I have num1, num1 is going to go to after I'm. If I have float, float's going to go to the percent 2f, and meister is going to go to the last one. So num1 is the first one, float1 is the second, and meister is the third one. Now why is this whole positional thing important? Well, it's important because if you get it wrong, you're going to get syntax errors, especially if you have format specifiers, which is what the colon dot 2f is. It's a format specifier. So an example of that is, well, I have num1, pi1, and meister. But in this case, num1 is the first one. Meister is now the second one. And the minute Python hits that, it's going to give you a syntax error. And that syntax error is because colon dot 2f cannot be applied to a string. So it's important to understand that these are positional and that Python's not going to assume anything. If, you're, if you've got a format specifier, it assumes that that argument number is going to go into that and it's going to be right. So format specifiers must match the type. Um, what is the colon for? The colon is just there um, as kind of the starting place. You can have, I believe you can have things in front of the colon. And I don't use floats that often, so I have to go out, back and actually look at the things you can. But basically, it's saying everything before the decimal place, and then only two um, values after the decimal place. That's basically how you read that. Does that place all the squiggly braces in a big scripting project, or is it for that line? So these squiggly braces are just for this line of code. They don't have anything to do with any other line of code. They are simply for that particular string. OK, so let's look at some format. Simple format. So this is basically a couple of different formatters. We have the exact same information here. I have I'm, you know, um, I'm first squiggly brace and it's 0.2f. So, and then I've got another one down here that just shows you the difference. So I can have two floats. I can have my float and diff and it. You can print 
them different ways. So I'm just going to run this one real quick and we will get to talking about the um, format. We will get to talking about the labs in a bit. So I'm just going to run this and you can see that it printed what we have. And it, it also printed the, the point 0.2F is here and the point 0.3F was there. And by the way, all these will, all, links to all these plus all the other ones you see in this project will be up on the, uh, will be part of the descriptions on the YouTube video. So, let's talk about labs. Is this how we would make sure we don't have spaces between text where we don't need it in regards to the assignment? Yes. This is one of the ways you can do that. It makes it much easier. From my perspective, it makes it much easier to read um, and to know when I put a space someplace and when I haven't. So lab 2.12. Um, in lab 2.12, I do something that I don't do with any other labs, and the school knows that I do this. The solution will be a, a link, because we haven't told you all of the information that you need to do this lab correctly. Because you need to understand, truly understand, if, elif, and decisions. And they give you a short stint of it and expect you to be able to use it on this lab and it is not right. So the solution for lab 2.12 will be on the YouTube site. Um, but we will talk through it now so you understand the flow. So basically what we have is you're going to enter um, you're going to enter first name, middle name, and last name. And then they're going to want you to output last name, comma, first initial dot, middle initial dot, or if there's, that's if there's three, but if you only put in the first name and the last name, you're just going to put last name, comma, first initial, period. Um, and so these are just little indicators of where you will find the information associated with this. And here is the flow chart basically. And we're going to be using these more and more as I go through the lectures because, first of all, next week you're going to need to, to make your own. Um, and also because I think they're a good way of understanding. So, you always start, we're going to declare a name, we're going to input last name, first name, middle name, and then we're going to declare a name list. We're going to split the name into the name list using a space delimiter. And then if the length of name list is greater than two, which is the part we haven't told you enough about yet, if that is false, then we're only going to print out name list of zero and name list of one zero, which is a multidimensional list, which we really haven't talked to you about yet either. If you have, if it's true, you're going to output the other format, which is the last name the first initial period and the middle initial. So that's lab 2.12. Lab 2.13 is you're going to input your string which contains a character and a phrase and whose output indicates the number of times the characters appear to be in the phrase. So again, we're going to declare a variable. We're going to input it and that input is going to be a string and a character. You're going to declare a list. You're going to then split Meister into the list using a space as a delimiter. You're going to declare care count. You're going to set the care count to the character count, and you're going to output the character count. And by the way, before tonight ends, I will go out and I will show you how to do that split. And then there's just a couple bubbles to help give you an idea of where the new stuff is in Zybooks. 2.14 is a little longer. A user is going to enter two words and a number. You're going to store each into separate variables. So you're going to have three different input statements. Um, 
that's one point. Then you're going to output two words using a combination of the user input. So the first one is basically um, the first word underscore the second word. And then the next output is the number followed by the first word followed by the number. This is where you're going to use that format specifier, the format specifiers, because it makes it much easier. And then you're going to output the length of each word. So that's where we're going to use the len function. So here, for starting, we're going to declare the first word. We're going to declare the second word. We're going to declare a number. We're going to input the first word. We're going to input the second word. We're going to input the number. So we're going to declare password 1. We're going to declare password 2. Here's where the new stuff starts. We're going to set password 1 to num password 1 num. So this is where you're going to use the format. You're going to set password 2 to word, under, word 1 underscore word 2. Oh, those are backwards. I apologize. That's just completely backwards. I output password 1 and output password 2. And you're going to output the length of password 1 and the length of password 2. And then you're going to end. And so these things are in section 2.7. So let's stop and let's see. The solution doesn't seem to be working. This is how we would make sure we don't have spaces between text when we don't need it in regards to the assignment. Yes. Okay. So hold on. The solution doesn't seem to be working. I managed to get, has got me stuck. Okay. So I'm having an issue with challenge activity concatenating strings. We can look at that. Again, you don't have to do the challenge activities. They're not part of the grade. Um, can you go back to the last lab flow chart? So is that 2.13? Oh, wait. Did I not do 2.14? Sorry, didn't have that right. OK, so let me ask you guys a couple questions. So Patrick, what's the last 2.14? OK, and then um, Mike, when you talk about the solution doesn't seem to be working, can you let me know which solution you're talking about? OK, so here's the, uh, let's just do this. So here's the flow chart in its entirety. Um, and by the way, you'll be able to, uh, I'll do what I did last week. I will put these up as separate images. So you can look at the images if you want, or you can also go through the um, and, and listen to me talk about it on the image. Sorry, on the video. My brain starts to fry at 10 o'clock, by the way. OK. so. All right, the if else. Um, so let's just go and look at lab 2.12. All right, here's the lab. So this is this is basically the solution for the lab. And again, the school knows that I show this to you, and it's because I I think what we've done is exceptionally unfair. Yeah, I would end up with two characters and the last name regardless. Let's take a look. Maybe I didn't do the solution right. I think I did. All right. So, let's do a little debugging. OK. So, yes. Okay, so that's different than what you came up with. So that's the one that will be up on the um, on the YouTube site. It says output differs from what they expect to what I am getting when it comes to the times. Is this for the challenge, Mike? Okay, so. 
if anybody if nobody has any other questions what I will do is I will go through this challenge and if you want to hang on the call feel free to hang on the call or if you have anything any specific questions go ahead and put them in the chat I'll go out and work through the challenge um, and anybody's free to stay or add any questions so Yes, PyCharm is different. Um, the date command is different. So let me go out and look at that. No problem, Veronica. So it was challenge, sorry, uh, challenge 2.1.2. So let's go take a look at challenge 2.1.2. Okay, so just more on 2.12 would be great. Thank you. Okay, we can go back through that. Let me do challenge 2.12 since that's what I said I was going to do. Challenge. Okay, do I have that number right? At the bottom. Okay, so let's go through this a bit. So basically they're saying write two statements to read in values from my city followed by my state. Do you do not provide a prompt? Assign log entry with current time. My city, my state value should be separated by a space. Sample output for the given program for that is that. Okay, so let's just take this, copy it here. Do I already have this one? Yeah. I already have this one. So let's go through it real quick. Challenge 2.12. Okay. Alright. Challenge 2.1.2. Okay. All right, so let's just, well, I shouldn't do this. Interstate. Okay. So let's just do those real quick, and we'll debug it, and we'll walk through it. So I'm going to go to the console, but I'm going to go to my favorite place, which is the variables, and it's going to say my city input. So I'm going to select a city. Alright, so let me step over this. And I think they said the city was Houston. Okay. And then the state is going to be Texas. Is that the right value they put in there? Is it capital TX? No, it's spelled out Texas. Okay. So let's spell that out as Texas. Okay, and then, whoops, I didn't step over that. Okay, so now I have current time. That's the current time they gave me. And then the log entry is going to be current time. Oh, actually, you know, I shouldn't have done it like this. Let me do this right. Log entry equals quote. Current time, space, my city, space, my state, dot, format, current time, my city, my state. Now let's do that. Let's stop this. Do it again. Console, so it's going to be Houston. Step over Texas. That's the current time. Log entry, print log entry. So if that's not what you're getting, let's go back here real quick. If that's not what you're getting, Uh, 
Okay. And it changes the time. Um, okay. So there are two states that it automatically puts into it. One is Houston and the other is Santa Barbara. And it changes the time. It works, but the current time needs to be input. Oh, okay. Then you would just input, have an input statement for the current time. Then that's just because they didn't tell you right. So it would be this. Oops. Let's just do this. Actually, I'm going to take those out because it doesn't really need to be there. So let's try this again. And we'll just run it this time. And so we're going to put in Houston, Texas, and we'll put in, actually, let me make this bigger so people can actually see what I'm doing, 2022 dash. What's today's date? The 13th. So 01 13 space. Uh, okay, I'm bad with military time. So that would be 2214. 2214 00 colon. So that's what you should see. And I am just playing the part of pie charm here. So is that, are you still getting errors for that, Mike? Okay. Um, I, are you in my class, Mike? I'm sorry. Um, I was going to say email me, but I don't feel comfortable having another student email me with questions um, that's not in my class. I think that's kind of stepping on toes. Um, the current time works, but with their values. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you're ta what you mean. Um, okay. So. Okay. Cool. So I think it'd be easier if I just spoke it. <laughs> I think you're right. So I have that I have that uh, script that you put in 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 um, my books. I have okay. my city equals input. My state equals input. I kept the current time at the time that they gave me for okay. Houston, and then I put log entry equals current time plus quotes plus my city plus quotes plus my state. Okay. And then I did a I can't say that word. Something string. You concatenated it. There, yeah, I concatenated string equals current time plus my city plus my state. I print log entry, and when I do a test with Houston, it gets it correct. But for the second one, testing with Santa Barbara, California, output differs and gives me that time is wrong because it's all in yellow, but Santa Barbara, California is correct. Okay, so did they change the time? I think so. For Santa Barbara, they did, not for Houston. Okay, and so are they giving you a new time? So uh, Mike he, is saying you have to do a date time. So, um, so when Python shows you that in yellow, is it a different date and time than what they have but then the static one that they have. Yes, it is. The one okay. that they have for Houston is 2014-726. The one from Santa Barbara is 2020-11-02-1245-55. Okay. Do you have this line? Did you make this an input? I tried doing that. It still gave me an error. So I don't know if it's me that necessarily is just... <laughs> no, no, I think it's... Um, Okay, this was the solution that worked for me if it helps. My city, my state, log entry equals current time. 
plus my city plus my state. Um, thank you, Leticia. I appreciate that. Okay. Um, I don't have the solutions. Oh, wait a minute. I'm going to view the solution. Okay, so that's what it is. They're saying that the current time should stay the same. So, uh, PyCharm, PyCharm is doing something wrong. And by the way, that happens. PyCharm is not perfect. It was written by people. <laughs> so, if this solution that Reticia shared isn't working for you, then it's PyCharm being funky because PyCharm can be funky. It, it relies on an exact match. Sorry, Zybooks can be funky. Um, mm -hmm. it re Zybook, it, Zybooks relies on an exact string match, spaces, cases, everything. And if you get one little thing wrong, you don't mm -hmm. get credit for it. Now, by the way, you're not required to do the challenges. The challenges are not part of your grade. So if you want to do the challenges, that's great. I encourage everyone to do the challenges. But if you're doing the challenges because you think that they're part of the participation grade, they are not. No, I'm doing them because I need practice because I actually am having very hard trouble even getting the basics. So I'm doing them just to get a better understanding of it. Uh -huh. And it's frustrating because I'm also trying to get much more proficient in finding the errors. Uh -huh. And I don't understand what Zybooks wants versus the coding that I have in there, which is what Reticia had put in uh, okay. the chat. Then the best thing I can say is that Zybooks is being weird. So okay. sometimes, and sometimes it's just that's the answer. I have students who email me frustrated, and I always say, send me your screen captures of what Zybooks is showing you, what you've got as your code. And sometimes it's just like, yeah, Zybooks got it wrong. Or you have a space off, but don't kill yourself for that space. You've done enough. So I'm sorry I don't have a better answer. It's fine. I appreciate your, your time explaining no that to me. It just makes me feel good that I knew that I was right there. But it's just, I wish I could get find a way to make it so that it works to get the other answer. But I guess it's... Yeah. Yeah. Don't dwell on it. <laughs> okay. So, Justin, um, you have a question about assignment 2-3. So, when you create the code and run it and debug it, when you save it to your computer and open the file just to check it before uploading it, to, and it says it was, it's, it, it says it, what is your name, which I enter the name, and your age, and I enter, and then the screen just disappears. Why doesn't it show the final output example? Hello, Amanda, you were born in 2016. So um, let me ask you a quick question. It says you're saying that it disappears. OK, then the screen just disappears. So what do you mean by the screen just disappears? Is there nothing showing up in the console, or does PyCharm crash? That's correct, Joseph. Only the participation activities and the labs are graded for PyCharm. You don't have to worry about um, the challenge activities. So, and there was another question as well. And I think I might have missed it. Let me go back. OK. So Ben, do you, would you like to do a little more on 2.12? OK. Oh, you got it. Cool. All right. So I'm glad everybody got what they needed. And um, I will have this up tomorrow along with the scripts. And um, I'm sorry you were stuck for six hours. 
Um, so I'm glad you're not stuck anymore. I'm going to post this tomorrow, and um, I will also send the announcement out to the professors with the link. But it'll just be up. It'll be the newest video on the YouTube channel. Oh, do you need to comment the code in the labs for full grade? Um, here's what I say about comments. Uh, uh, Mike, 2.12 will be in the a link in the description um, uh, on the YouTube channel. Um, here's what I say about comments. Um, for the labs. I do not ask my students to comment. Um, the labs are the labs. When you are writing your own code that you're going to put in for an assignment, I ask that my students comment them enough to know that I understand that they know what they're doing. Um, but I can't answer for another professor. Uh, yes, I can share the YouTube link here. Okay, so here's the link to the channel. There's the link to the channel. Oh, thanks everybody for sharing the link. Um, so I am going to close up shop now. I hope everyone has a good week and just to let everyone know again, next week's lecture will be on Wednesday night and I'll put that out in the announcements and I'll send that to the professors. It will not be on Thursday night because I will be traveling. Good night everybody.